Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Critical Podcast. My name is Jimmy Good, and I'm your host, and joining me this week is a very special guest from What's Good Games, and kind of funny, it's Andrea Renee. Andrea, how are you doing? What's good, Jimmy? Oh, that's, dude, that's very good. And, you know, <laughs> hilariously, because, I mean, I'm good because it's just my last name, and I swear it really is my last name. I'd show you the driver's license, but, you know, I've already, I've already done that too many times. But anyway... Andrea, uh, I know it's been kind of a day for you here because there's been so much Sony's come out with and talked about some things. But before we get into it, before we talk about all the fun things we want to get into, I want you to provide us with a baseline. Tell us about your favorite movies, favorite games, favorite stuff like that so people can get to know you. Sure thing. Well, thanks for having me. I know it took us a little bit of time to get the um, scheduling worked out. So I appreciate your patience. They don't call me the busiest lady in the business for nothing. Um, it's a, an incredibly hectic time of year. We're about to head to Boston for PAX East, which is super exciting. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So some of the stuff that I like to play and like to watch, man, uh, there's a lot. So it's interesting how my taste in video games has kind of changed as I've gotten older and tried more things. When I was younger, I was really big into puzzle platformers and to arcade racing games, really loved music and rhythm, still do, but now I really enjoy um, third person action adventure games, first person shooters, and shooters in general are one of my uh, favorite franchises, or I shouldn't say franchises, say genres to play. Um, and I also enjoy really narrative heavy stuff. So stuff that has uh, moral consequences and really kind of stops and makes you think. So right now I've been playing um, a ton of The Division 2, obviously everybody is, but I'm a long time Destiny player, Destiny 2 player. I really love Rainbow Six Siege. Assassin's Creed is one of my favorite franchises of all time. Um, if you've listened to any of my shows, you know that I love Guitar Hero and Rock Band. They're some of my all time favorites. Um, also really love games like Portal, Bioshock, um, anything from the Super Mario Brothers franchise. I grew up on Mario. I mean, like, it kind of runs the gamut of stuff that I like. It's almost easier to say what I don't play than what I do play. Um, where my big gap is, is JRPGs. It's just not my thing. Nothing not against them. They're just not for me. Yeah. That's what we have um, Brittany around for. Uh, she uh, takes up the JRPG mantle for our group. Shimmer so likes JRPGs too. I don't want to leave her out. I don't want her to listen to the show and be like, hey, I like JRPGs yeah. too. <laughs> um, but I play all kinds of different games. So um, for what I do for work, I have the absolute honor and privilege to be able to spend a lot of time playing games that I wouldn't normally probably have spent time with. Things that I may be pushed to play that I'd be like, you know, I didn't really want to play that, but I'm glad that I did. One of those games for me, particularly last year, was Celeste. Um, even though I love platformers, the kind of super difficult pixel perfect mechanics that Celeste demanded was something that I was like, you know what? I don't want to hate myself when I'm playing this game. So I was going to pass on it, particularly because that art style is a little off-putting to me. Sure. I, I feel like it's just overdone. That's kind of 16-bit or 8-bit art style. But man, that game hooked me with its incredible narrative work and the storytelling and how they wove the mechanics in with that storytelling was really fantastic. So glad that they got the accolades that they deserved. So um, that's just kind of in a nutshell, me and video games. When it comes to stuff I watch, I mean, I'm kind of a reality TV junkie in a way, which is maybe a little embarrassing to admit. But um, when it comes to movies, I, I love all kinds of stuff. I grew up, you know, a child of the 80s and 90s. So a lot of classic rom-coms and kind of feel-good movies, almost anything with Michael J. Fox in it, I'm a huge fan of. <laughs> um, also like old school um, movies, like one of my favorites to dig out deep to see if people's movie cred is legit is The Legend of Billie Jean with the uh, Slater brother and sister, Helen Christian Slater. Excellent film, if you've never watched it. I have never watched it, I'm sorry. What, really? It's I'm so sorry, I have to be honest with you. <laughs> Dude, Helen Slater, I sadly miss her in current movies. She was like such a goddess back then. Loved it. Um, Footloose is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, both the literature, of course, first, and then the animated films, and then, of course, the Peter Jackson movies that came later, some of my all-time favorites. Big Harry Potter fan as well. Something people don't necessarily know about me is that I'm really big into fantasy fiction. So I am 
one of the people that has finished all 14 books of the wheel of time. I uh, love that series. Um, I have gotten really big into the stormlight archives from Brandon Sanderson. He of course helped Robert Jordan finish the wheel of time. So really love his work and love how prolific he is. He writes fast. Unlike George R. R. Martin. Who writes yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I do love the Game of Thrones book, but also um, Patrick Rothfuss, um, King Killer Chronicles is also one of my new faves. The Wise Man's Fear, which is the second book in that series, has become one of my top three books of all time. So very, very good. But anyway, that's kind of me rambling on a little bit about the kind of stuff I like. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so there's just a few things I need to pick out of there. First off, reality TV, Bachelor, do you watch it? No, I want. Right. The um the opening episode because it was just on TV, but <laughs> it's just so produced, and I just yeah. cannot stand catty women who do this backstabbing thing. And like, I'm gonna talk about her when she's not in the room. I'm just like, I have no time for that. I'm a very direct person. Anybody who's met me um in person or online or otherwise knows that I tend to not beat around the bush, and sometimes it bites me in the ass a little bit. Um, because some people don't like that. They don't like how direct I am. And so that part of reality TV, no. When I say reality TV junkie, I mean more like cooking shows, home improvement shows. So like we just finished watching Top Chef for the season, one of my all-time favorite reality shows. Love Top Chef. I'm also kind of hooked to HGTV. Fixer Upper is one of my faves. I'm really sad that that's going away. But now they're getting their own new network, so hopefully they'll be back. Uh, love that show. Love Chopped. Um, like some of the stuff that's on Bravo now was a big project runway fan, but I don't know how I feel about the reboot with Carly Kloss and Christian Siriano is no Tim Gunn. <laughs> yeah. There's no, make it work. You're not making it work guys. Come on now. Oh, right. How do you replace Tim Gunn with Christian Siriano? You don't, you don't. I'm sure he's a lovely human being, but <laughs> he is younger than me. He's nobody's mentor. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's so, I love it. That's there's the directness coming out right there. I love it. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, another thing you did mention though, and I, I bet a lot of like people who listen to me talk all the time, my favorite films, uh, maybe some of my favorite media of all time, The Lord of the Rings, uh, that trilogy right there. And I'm so happy you brought it up because that is something uh, that is near and dear to my heart. And every time I talk to someone who brings that up unprompted, I always feel like there's kind of a kinship because like you have to be kind of a dedicated type of person to love The Lord of the Rings Absolutely. in the way that a lot of these people do, like extended cuts and all just being like, yeah, I give me more of it. Middle Earth in the studio. That is really cool. Uh, and my weirdly enough, and this is sorry, maybe I've told before on the show, but my mom back in the 60s had a map of Middle Earth and she put it up in her dorm room and people would ask her where that was on planet Earth. And she's like, no, I'm just like into Tolkien. And they're like, what's what are you talking about? Like, so she was kind of like a nerd in the book sense. And then when what? Lord of the Rings came out. Yeah, she got to share it with me as like a kid because I was like 11, 12, and 13 when those movies came out. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Uh, yeah. they, hold up, man. They, they hold up. How did you feel about Hobbit? Um, Well, the book is incredible, of course. Yes. But I mean, I actually really liked the series. I just rewatched it with my other Tolkien nerd friend, uh, Alexa Ray Correa. And um, I, listen, the third movie in the Hobbit's film Kind of unnecessary. I did like the way they did the Battle of the Five Armies, but I think that all the all the stuff they added with Tario was kind of like, I get that they were trying to flesh out the story to make it more cinematic because in reality, that book is actually pretty short yep. compared to the Lord of the Rings series. So I get that they were trying to just maximize their box office buck for that. But, you know, I am of the mindset that I didn't hate it. Was it as good as the Lord of the Rings? No, of course not. But was it bad? No, I didn't think it was bad. But I also like the Transformers movies. Hate me if you want. Really? Okay, so wait, which which Transformers film is your favorite? Do you have a favorite one? Um, you know, I've never ranked them, but I like two. Obviously, one is good. Um, I haven't seen Bumblebee yet. I feel I haven't I'm either. Horrible I'm... about that. It's okay. I'm, Don't worry about I'm it. Really busy when it when that it'll be on digital soon. Yeah. But yeah, never actually stopped to rank the uh the Transformers movies. That's okay. They kind of all run together for me. And I always find myself walking out in the past when I would see them in theaters, like the last fight scenes, always like, I was always like, man, that was such a cool fight scene or whatever. Uh, and I think the last one, or was it the, the last night or whatever, the one with Mark Wahlberg, the most recent one before Bumblebee, that was the one that kind of made me frustrated, but I've, I've still found enjoyment in those films too. So don't worry. It's like fast and the furious. Like if you say you like fast and the furious. I feel like a lot of people are like, how dare you? And it's like, no, no, no. I just, I kind of like them. You know, it's, they're kind of dumb fun. 
Yeah, tolerate. yeah, exactly. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Okay, so now we have a baseline. Man, you you like a lot of things. There's nothing wrong with that. When you were saying it's probably easier for you to talk about, you know, the games that you don't like or the movies you don't indulge in. It's the same way that when I was going to introduce you, I was looking through your your credibilities and all the things you've done and i was like i think it's easier at this point to just say what you haven't done uh because there's just like so <laughs> many different things i was like oh my gosh like look at this stuff because i know you you know originally i remember seeing you um in gamestop like seeing you in the ads like actually in the like the tvs in the stores and stuff I'm like yeah oh, you know TV. yep and then like game trailers and stuff like that too so it was one of those things i was like oh, and you've always been at the tip top of my list which is over here on a whiteboard of like podcast guests and you're like oh and i was wow, like yeah so i was like you. i was like i'm not giving up do this um so i appreciate <laughs> you finally like i know you're super busy so uh it was it's so cool to have you here uh let's get into it though because we've talked about you know what you like but we need to get into a little bit of the news we just had something interesting hop up it seems like nintendo is a trendsetter even though people don't think that they are sometimes, they are a trendsetter, and it seems like Microsoft and more so Sony right now are kind of taking that Nintendo Direct approach with this Nintendo, or sorry, Sony state of play. 20 minutes long, roughly, uh, kind of talking about the upcoming games that we're gonna have here in the next few months, and then a lot of VR kind of pushed, it seems like, as well. I just wanted to get your kind of feelings after we just watched this. What did you think of the state of play? I was surprised by how short it was. I thought yeah. it was going to be longer. I guess I was anticipating something like 30 to 45 minutes long. It was only like probably a little less than 20 minutes total. But we got some good information. We knew that we were going to see Days Gone because that release date is less than a month away now or almost exactly a month away. Um, and we got some release dates for a lot of PlayStation VR projects. Clearly, Sony is going to be pushing PlayStation VR at the end of this cycle. So as the PS4 sunsets into whatever the PS5 is going to be, I would imagine that they're going to continue to invest in VR titles. So it's good that we got some release dates for that stuff. Um, I was hoping that we were going to get a release date for Dreams, but we did get a release window for Conquer Genie, another game that we've seen from them quite a few times over the last few years, and we haven't really heard much about. But I think what people really want to know is where are the big triple A's coming? Like, when are we getting The Last of Us Part Two? When are we getting Death Stranding? And we still haven't really gotten that information yet. Like, Ghost of Tsushima is like, yes, when's that yes. coming? <laughs> so there was a lot left. But of course, I we all know that they're going to save that for the next quarter around E3. While they may not be at E3, it would be silly of them to not take advantage of the tidal wave of... PR and marketing that happens around that event and the sheer amount of web traffic that happens around that event to not announce something. Just like EA is technically not at E3, they still have EA play around E3. So I imagine come June, PlayStation will have another state of play to put out during E3. Yeah, I think you're totally right. And I think it's just, it's a smart move, especially, you know, it might feel kind of like a letdown for people since the last E3 because we haven't really gotten anything from Sony in a big way since then. So I think a lot of people were expecting what you said. It's like Ghost of Tsushima, Last of Us, you know, stuff like that or Death Stranding. And it's like, where is it? And I thought and I was tricked, Andrew, I was tricked because at the beginning they're like, there's the guy, there's the first person view. He's talking to Friday. It's an Iron Man game. And I was like, oh, my God, it's that Avengers game we've been waiting for. Oh, my gosh. I was like losing uh, it. And then it was like, yes. <laughs> and it was like Iron Man VR. And I was like. Oh, no. Well, like... I mean, I think of all the Marvel characters, Iron Man is perfect for a VR game. Oh, with, for sure. with everything that's going on and the helmet. Um, and so I'm excited that they announced this. I think it's going to be cool. Listen, when Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics are ready to actually unveil the Avengers game, it's going to be a standalone event. They're not going to be a blurb at the beginning of PlayStation's conference. This is going to be huge. You know, they've been keeping their cards close to their chest because the Avengers franchises and, and, and properties around the Marvel Universe have so much weight and gravitas that they really need to handle it delicately and make it big and make it important and just tagging it on to something, whether it be from Xbox, Nintendo, or PlayStation, or Epic Game Store for that matter, whoever, like this needs to be its own thing. And so once that's ready, like don't anticipate it being on anybody's stage for the reveal. I, I fully believe 
they're going to do their own thing, much like we saw Activision do with Destiny 2, sure. like we saw Warner Brothers do recently with Mortal Kombat 11, right? So I think it's going to be something along those lines. Sure. Maybe I'm just a dreamer because I feel like I've been waiting so long and I just feel like it was such a good tease. I was like, oh my gosh, here we go. And with Avengers kind of fever, you know, reaching a fever pitch, I just yeah. think like maybe they also are holding off to to like show this after you know, Endgame comes out oh, that way. They don't want to mix the messages here. Marvel is super smart about the way they do their marketing. The last thing they want to do is release a game that might mix storylines or anything canonically, right? With those characters, they got to right. tread very carefully when it comes to that stuff. So once Endgame is out and out of the way, then Square Enix and Crystal will have a lot more freedom to do some kind of announcement. Yeah, got to cash on on Iron Man while he's still around. Uh, that's no, just, I know, uh, here. <laughs> exactly. Oh, he's not going away, just, you know, Robert Downey. Exactly. He'll just pop up once in a while somewhere in some form because it's comics, man. Comic movies, anything can happen. It, nothing's yeah. ever set in stone. Uh, exactly. But I felt like they're pushing a lot of the virtual reality stuff. It seemed like everything or a lot, maybe like 60 to 80% of it seemed like they were kind of saying like, oh, this is PSVR, like we're showing off, you know, No Man's Sky, we're showing, was it Blood and Truth, which you said you got in your hands on, true? Did you get to play yeah, that? Yeah, so I actually got to play that back at E3 Judges Week last year. So it looks a lot better now than it did then. Obviously, we're more than six months beyond uh, when I played that the first time. Um, but it, I really liked it because it felt like a spy thriller, almost like playing like a Mission Impossible movie. Oh, my gosh. It's yes. From, yeah. It's from the same team that did London Heist, which was super popular from the PlayStation VR demo disc. And except it's not just a single isolated uh, scene. It's a whole game. And it's like so it's a whole um story that you get to play through and so i think it's going to be really good and i would like to try it again but i really enjoyed the time that i had back then so i can only imagine it's better now yeah definitely when i saw that i guess i was getting that same uh, london heist vibes because they were kind of like shooting around to like different like first person shots and then there was a shot where there was like two arms like put really close together holding two guns and i was like oh okay now i know i was like yeah this is kind of familiar but i it looks cool and i know a few of those actors. I was like, hey, I know that guy. I'm like, oh, cool. That's really uh, neat that they got them in. Because I always feel like that ups the ante, and especially in a narrative focus game like this, to be like, oh, wow, like this guy, we know him from some other things, and they look like they're really into it and kind of telling the story uh, in a different way, potentially kind of retelling it. And I know you're not a JRPG fan, but for people who like Persona 5, very much like this, where you're kind of being interrogated and maybe telling it out of context or something like that. I don't know if that's yeah. what the vibe you got to when you played. Well, not really. I mean, the vertical slice that they showed us was pretty isolated, but I mean, I, maybe I'm just used to seeing games in these weird settings, so I don't really think about it that way. Sure. Is there anything from all of this that really like got you excited? Because uh, we didn't really get we got like maybe one or two announcements for games, but most of the big stuff was just kind of saying like, hey, it's coming in like a month. So yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that almost well, there was a couple of announcements, but nothing that really you know, blew my skirt up or anything like that. I was excited to see that um, Falcon Age is coming sooner than I thought it was. For some oh, reason, sure. I thought that game was uh, a couple of months away, but it's like literally like two weeks away, which is very exciting. I got to play that recently at GDC, the Game Developers Conference, and that whole team from Outer Loop is so wonderful. And the game looks adorable, and you get to dress up your little Falcon, and it's it's really cute. You get to like fist bump them and stuff too. Do you like There's little all hand kinds things? of emotes that you get to do. There's this one where you put your fingers together like this in the shape of a heart for people that are listening. And the bird like sticks his face through the heart. And I'm like, oh my God, it's so cute. That's very cute. Yeah, because that was yeah. like, I looked at them like, oh, that that's a cute game. Like that's a that's a VR selling point for me. Because I'm like, but you I know, mean, some of these ones. Don't be, don't be fooled, Jimmy. That Falcon is a murder machine. Okay. okay. Yeah. You go hunting with it. It hunts down rabbits and it brings their carcasses back to you. It's an animal that is clearly a hunting machine. Excellent. So am I just killing rabbits to eat them? And that's, is it kind of survival-esque? I'm not really familiar with the game. Oh, so the game itself is, a, is like an action exploration game. So there are two modes. There's one mode that has combat and one that doesn't. So they added in an exploratory mode because they wanted it to be approachable for younger players or maybe people who aren't interested in doing uh, the combat and just want to kind of like play around with their bird. And what it is essentially is a like a first person exploration game where you play, uh, I believe you play a young girl who's 
trying to help her try. I'm going to get this wrong. I feel like I should look this up. Um, but essentially, you go on these missions uh, with your bird and you go and let me see here. Okay, here we go. First person single player action adventure as Ara. Yes. You learn to hunt, gather, and fight to reclaim her cultural legacy in the lost art of falcon hunting against a force of automated colonizers. Whoa, that sounds intense. Yeah. So it says here, like, Ara has been wrongfully thrown in jail for a minor infraction while she awaits her fate. She passes the time by befriending a young falcon. Together they escape and set off on an adventure to help the resistance claim their freedom and drive off the invaders. That's cool. And it's also got a bunch of cute birds in it. So like it's it's a bit of everything, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. So that one, that one sounds exciting out of the VR stuff. Is like, are you a No Man's Sky fan, by the way? Did you ever get into that? I didn't. I played it at launch, which obviously was a mistake for a variety of reasons. <laughs> um, but it's not really my type of game because generally I like to have like a set purpose in a game. Um, I'm not the kind of person who likes to just hop into a game world just to purely explore it. I like to have a directive. And so it was a little too ethereal for me and not linear enough. But it doesn't mean it's a bad game. just meant it wasn't for me. And I love that they added a lot more game modes and, and a lot more to do in the world and really gave it some, some meat over the last 12 months. And I thought it was really impressive how the community came back and rallied around all the changes you know, that Hello Games did and, and was really happy for that team. But it being in VR is like, cool. It definitely has the art style that would fit really well for PlayStation VR. But it's not something that I'm going to be like rushing out to play. Um, there were a couple things that I played on Oculus that were really cool that I saw at GDC, mostly like Beat Saber and Oculus Quest, which is amazing yeah but that's uh see I'm, I'm with you too i i think the term ethereal is a really good way of putting it it seems like you know the purpose is nebulous you know to kind of go out and just like explore and like i guess for me when they started talking about like all the number of different planets and stuff i was like so i won't ever see like like one percent of all the planets and stuff because it's like procedurally generated but there's like a trillion of them, or whatever it was and to do that in like yeah. first person i was like okay like <laughs> Great. Yeah, like, it's, the, it's a little daunting, but like once you got into the game world, when you saw the difference in the procedurally generated worlds, you could see that they were using a set amount of assets that were then just being like reconfigured amongst each other. And so while they technically were different, they weren't really that different. Okay. Good to does know. That, does that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Well, and it's There's nice too that played. Yeah, um, and it is a free update. We should mention that too, like for anybody who does have uh, No Man's Sky, and if you do have a PSVR, it will be free, it sounds like. So it's not like you have to buy it or anything. And I think that's probably a smart move because if you put a price tag on there, I just, I don't really know how many people would indulge in that. I'm not sure. Probably enough to at least recoup their development costs. I'm actually oh, really surprised that they made it free. Uh -huh. um, it doesn't, I guess maybe give it a, to as a, at a discount to people that already own no man's sky, but I would have thought for sure they would have put a retail skew on this, but Hey, mm. I guess they're doing so well. They don't need to. That's cool. Yeah. Maybe Sony is just like, Hey, you know, here's a little goodwill for all that stuff that happened. And now when you can look back, you know, to no man's sky, we'll always still think about the launch, but maybe yeah, someone well. somewhere. Will... <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> giving them money because they felt bad about something. Well, I, that's true. That's, I don't, but, it's not it, <laughs> well, I still think that like, why do it then? Like, is it just to push like VR headsets? Is that the is that the hope? Is that they have enough of well, a player base there? It's possible that VR was part of their original agreement with PlayStation when they made the agreement to launch on PlayStation Four, and they just never put it in because they were like, "Listen, the game's on fire. We have to fix it in all these other ways, and then we'll get to the VR agreement." It's possible that was part of the deal that they structured in, and that's why we're seeing it now. But I don't. I mean, I don't know. I'm not privy to those conversations. Yeah, exactly. Nor am I, or at least I can't say anything, right, Mr. Layden? Um, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, but uh, the other two things I do want to talk about briefly from this are the two big things at the end. I'm kind of surprised the day's gone because we've been waiting, like with Concrete Genie, which we have to kind of shout out to that because I know a lot of people who listen to this like love Concrete Genie. Uh, we're actually finally kind of moving forward with it, and it seems like they're focusing more on the narrative now, which 
is surprising and good to me because before it seemed like a glorified tech demo. And that's not to kind of throw any shade at Days Gone, but for so long, we just see demo after demo of like how many zombies we can get on screen. And there was like a little bit of story, but now it feels like the story is more prominent than ever before. Does that kind of sell you at all one way or the other on Days Gone? Well, it sounds like you missed the feature that I did on Days Gone with John Garvin from Sony I, Bit. I, well, um, I, well, I, well, I wanted you to promote it. You went on the bus on your own show. Um, so I had the amazing opportunity to get about four to five hours of hands-on time with Days Gone at a press event about a month ago. Um, I sat down with John for, uh, from the team. He's the creative director and the head of the studio. And asked him a bunch of questions, which if people who are watching or listening are interested, you can find the video with uh, new gameplay at uh, youtube.com slash what's good games if you want to watch that interview. And we take a, a deep dive into the game. And I asked him a bunch of questions because I, like you, were like, this is just another zombie game. And they were like, they're not zombies, they're freakers. And let me tell you why. And the whole backstory about who the freakers are and how they play in the world, I think, is unique enough to give it a little bit of a different hook than some of these other zombie games that we have seen or, or that are still yet to come. And so I appreciate that, particularly from a combat perspective, not having to focus on critical headshots is amazing um, because you have these massive hordes that you're going to have to deal with, which is m different than like a Resident Evil 2 style game. You know what I mean? Which is a lot like slower pace and more atmospheric. Now, what I love what they're doing with Days Gone is that they're really doing world building and narrative in a way that we don't tend to see in a lot of open world games where over 20% of the campaign is cutscenes and you go in and out of the cutscenes just in the open world. And the loading screens that I saw even back then were pretty minimal. And he said, by the time we get to launch and they've done their final polish pass or those loading screens are going to get even smaller. So I was really impressed by the tech. Um, I had a really cool conversation with him about the motion capture that they did for the cutscenes. People might recall that Sony Ben worked on Uncharted Golden Abyss, so they worked very closely with Naughty Dog on their motion capture technology, and so they took a lot of those lessons learned in Today's Gone. You see a lot of hints of Uncharted style of game making throughout this game, and I think that's nothing but a good thing um, because this game, as a new IP, has a lot to prove. Now, I really appreciated that they spent some time fleshing out Deacon as a character and saying, hey, this isn't just about killing zombies or killing freakers or moving the hordes around and going against other human factions. This is about discovering, you know, who Deacon is, where he comes from and why his story with his wife, Sarah is important and what happens with him and, and Boozer, which I think is his friend's name in the game. Um, and one of the most poignant things that he and I discussed in the interview was that when you press the pause button, it says how many days gone it's been in your playthrough. So for me, it was like 738 days gone. And so it's coming all going back to this kind of ground zero moment for Deacon as a character and what happened in that world. And the story and the narrative really builds around that about like where he's been, what happened in that time and where he's going. And I think that they're doing some really interesting narrative work. And it certainly has me more hooked than I ever have been because I wasn't very hyped for this game. I was like, I don't need another open world game. There's too many of them already. Yeah, yeah. I don't really care for zombie games. They're just so bleak and sad. But there's a lot more beneath the surface with this game. And I am excited to play it in a couple weeks. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll link that video down below. I wanted you to get a chance to kind of talk about that interview a little bit. Because selfishly, that's it's so interesting. And I like that's the dream is to be able to talk to these people because like getting through all of this stuff, especially like at a PAX situation where you can just go shake a developer's hand and like put away all like the internet and all like kind of this bias and stuff and just be like, who are the people who make these things? And why did they make them? And like, how are they making them? It's so fascinating. I love it so much. So it's very cool that you get to do that. And you have a ton of stuff over on your channel with that. And it's just like, Corey Barlog's on again. Excellent. Like, I'm just like, yeah. Ooh. I, we, it was so great to finally get Corey in the studio. I mean, it's so tough. Not only is he a very busy person, but we wanted to make it make sense, you know, because PlayStation has a lot of restrictions about what Corey can and can't talk about on camera, um, as you can imagine. And so when he said he was coming into town for GDC and doing his amazing reinventing God of War talk um, at the conference, I was like, oh my God, amazing. Let's talk about it. So he's wonderful. And we're really glad that he's a fan of the show. But we wanted to just like, 
nerd out with him about other games that aren't God of War. And so hopefully we'll be able to do that at some time in the future. But until then, talking about God of War, not such a bad thing either. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite things, too, is to get people on and talk about things they don't normally get to talk about, because I find that more often than not, people in these types of industries, especially the games industry, they love more than just like their one game or just games. They have like movies that they love so much or TV shows or just things that you'd be like, oh, you like that type of music? I want to hear about this like that. That's the really fascinating stuff to me. So that's really cool. Uh, Days Gone, though, you know, for me, again, just kind of seeing this and from the other, other coverage that we have seen, it, it did sp- like kind of spark my interest a little bit more now kind of them really pushing that narrative and like you said kind of having that pass with naughty dog it's really showing here even with that one guy who was in like the hazmat suit and like he was like showing emotion which usually in a game if you're in a hazmat suit that's like impossible to do but they actually did that i was like problem right he's always got the visor down yeah i was like this guy was like there's something here (laughs) yeah i was like hey there you go i like that uh and the last thing they talked about a little bit I'm not the biggest Mortal Kombat fan. I'm so sorry, everybody. I was more of a Marvel vs. Capcom kind of guy. Uh, Andrew, I don't know. if Do you have a, a love for fighting games in, in any stretch? I mean, Mortal Kombat is my all-time favorite fighting game. So, um, shots fired. I yeah, guess. you're welcome. Um, That's no, right. When it comes to the fighting game genre in general, though, no. I don't play a lot of it because, like, any combat game, whether it be shooter or fighter or hack and slash, And if it's competitive at at all, you have to practice, 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 practice to be good at it. And I just bounce around from games too often. Um, I do love the work that NetherRealm has done on that franchise over the years and really seen how they've let their work on Injustice influence where modern Mortal Kombat is. I know that there's some people out there that don't like that. There are times when I look at some of the graphics now and go, wow, the blood physics in that are super cool, but also it's really gross. Maybe yeah. it was better when the graphics weren't so good because then you could kind of laugh at it a little bit more because sometimes it's, it really straddles that, that line between being over-the-top ridiculous violence that's so fantastical that you can't help but think it's crazy and then also being like, wow, that's really maybe going a little bit too vivid And the brains and the guts and the textures and everything just looks too real. And I'm kind of grossed out. But obviously that game is based in high fantasy. And what I love about the storyline is that it's just so silly. And I love it even more that they bring in this character, Kronika, who's like, yeah, I'm just going to mess with time. So we can just erase all the decisions we've made at this point up until up until now in the franchise. And I'm like, what an amazing narrative conceit to be like, you know what? We need a reason to change all the things that we did in the past. Let's make a time shifting character. It's like, okay, well, sure. Let's just throw it all out the window. See, that's the nice thing about Injustice because I loved Injustice 2. They'll just do something crazy with the Flash in Injustice 3 because they could do it at any time and be like, well, just screw it up again. Like Injustice 2 is kind of weird. Let's do that yeah. again, just being super weird. But yeah, uh, I, I love that you brought that up about having Injustice kind of inform Mortal Kombat. In the first place, having Mortal Kombat inform Injustice. And I think it's really interesting. I like the whole kind of the gear system like i like being able to switch some of that out and it seems like they're going insane this time with mortal Kombat. and like those games have just so much stuff in them like even if you're kind of a casual player at least there's like so much to unlock and so much to do and you know i'm not really competitive with these types of things because i will just get destroyed but from like playing a lot of injustice and seeing a lot of the mortal Kombat stuff and how it's changing it it does look interesting and the story i've never been able to follow but now even less so because now it's like oh, i'll take like the 90s or whatever versions and like smash them in with yeah. t- you know <laughs> like, i mean I've, and yeah and i've played pretty much every single mortal Kombat game that's ever existed and it's hard for me to follow but i i do like that they've brought back a lot of classic characters i still want them to make sindel playable ed boon please help me out um but I think the animation looks beautiful. I think the art style is really fantastic. I love what they're doing with the narrative from a a single player campaign perspective. And then you've got the combat towers, which really give a lot of replayability for people who like you don't want to even get close to dipping their toes in competitive waters. There's lots to play and lots of challenge to be had if you are looking for it. And then, of course, you know, the the variants and the gem systems that they're bringing over from Injustice are really going to change it up. I'm still like a little on the fence um, about the gem system because it feels 
it just smacks a little bit too much of microtransactions to me and yeah, maybe yeah. even micromanaging the way that the characters play. I'm all about player choice, but when you have such defined characters in a universe, it kind of feels a little off-putting to say, oh, you get to change up how Scorpion, you know, throws his dagger, right? That's for example. True, yeah. So I'm like, like I said, I need to play more of it and discover more of how that all works. And then the crypt, which I hated from the last Mortal Kombat, they haven't confirmed nor denied if it's coming back. Um, which, you know, I really just did not care for, but the game itself looks great. I'm absolutely looking forward to playing it. It's probably my most anticipated game of April, uh, for sure. Next to day is gone. So yeah, going to have a lot of fun with that. Cool. So who is your favorite Mortal Kombat character besides Sindel? Uh, Katana. Oh, I love Katana. Um, Kung Lao is really fun too. I mean, Raiden, who doesn't love the, th the God of Thunder, right? Um, or Thunder God, I guess technically they don't call him the god of thunder but um he, he's really cool um i like scarlet she was a really fun addition um you know i wanted to really like sonya blade more i just never got into her attitude she was just okay. never my thing but yeah katana is probably my favorite before sindel fair enough like i said i was a casual fan so i was i always enjoyed sub zero that was my guy i just like yeah sub -Zero. No, sub zero is excellent i mean scorpion is took me a long time to warm up to over the years but once you learn his moveset, his combos are super fun to execute. But yeah, yeah the, who doesn't like throwing ice balls? Yeah, exactly. Like ice sword, make an ice clone. I Ice yeah. is just such a great... I always think about this like, you know, in action adventure games with RPGs as well. Like ice may be my favorite element because not only is it like high damage is associated with high crit chance with like shatter and stuff, but it's also like mm -hmm. really great crowd control and something about just freezing a bunch of people and being like, all right, now I get to decide what to do. Like that's yeah, so cool for me. Absolutely. I really love Devora, one of the new characters they introduced in the last game. Um, I think she's got a really fun play style with like the acid attacks and the venom and all the bugs and everything. But I mean, there's just so many, you know, like I could just like keep going. It's like there's Cabal and there's Jax and I don't know, man. I just like I really like Mortal Kombat. It's a great series. That's cool. I'm excited for you. So you're gonna be you're gonna be there day one. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, good. That's good. I just wanna I just wanna see. You know, I'll have to check out and be like, all right, let's see what one of the experts says about it. I think I have heard though that the crypt is coming back. I don't know if they've officially confirmed it, but I was listening to I think it was like Angry Joe or something who's like talking yeah. to Ed Boone about it, and he was like, Are we doing like the crypt? And they're like, um, yeah, kind of like you know. Uh, oh, so Ed wasn't probably supposed to say something about it, and he did. Probably that seems to be what I mean, happened. I talked. It was a little bit more tight lipped about it. I'm sure they're and they're like over here as just like, yeah, we're totally doing it. And they're like. Ed, no, like, uh, this oh, is great. Uh, well, but either way, this will make it better. Yeah, I don't know. It sounds like it's something people wanted to have back, and I think they'll just keep adding on to it. And then I just think of like this kind of one upsmanship between that and then Injustice that they'll probably just keep doing, where I'll just be like, Injustice 3 will be even more insane. And then, you know, the next Mortal Kombat 12, which be like, just like keep building well, off each other. What's nice is that they're inherently different franchises for a variety of reasons. And that's why I love that they don't directly compete with each other. Yeah. Because the things that happen in the Mortal Kombat universe could never happen with DC characters, right? It just would not, like, DC would be like, no, you're not going to, like, brutalize our characters in these way, in this way. And so I think it's always going to be, you know, the more family-friendly, for lack of a better word. I mean, don't get me wrong. Some of those moves are still pretty brutal. It's a fighting game, after all. But Mortal Kombat is, like, on its own pedestal. Yeah. Well, yeah. And obviously it's like one of the like true kind of grandfathers of the fighting game genre. So like it's always going to be held. And it's so cool that it's still going throughout time, kind of like Legend of Zelda. It's like it's just still going like it's just very different kind of in certain ways. And Mortal Kombat has evolved, but it still retains that DNA, that heritage. And that's a beautiful thing that NetherRealm just keeps doing. It's just like they just keep making good ones. It's just like good on you guys. Yeah, man. Just tell them to bring back friendships and we're good to go. Okay. <laughs> I will. When I call Ed tonight, we usually like to uh, call each other before we go to bed. So um, I'll definitely mention it to him. I'll be like, hey, man, you make that happen. Okay, you do that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, the last thing I do want to talk about here before we kind of start to uh, kind of get towards the end of the show here. You talked about Lord of the Rings and loving it. And I saw this pop up today and I have to bring it up. Um, apparently, they're making a Gollum a, game. An yes? action, yeah, a Gollum action adventure game. Uh, what what is that going to be? Do you do you have any ideas about what that could possibly be? I have, I have no idea. Well, like, so I read the a Hollywood Reporter article about this, and so what it looks like is that 
um, they're going to be kind of playing off the dual sides of Gollum and Smeagol and how there's going to be decisions that you can make as Smeagol or decisions you can make as Gollum. And that's going to affect the gameplay of the entire game. And I think that that's a really cool idea because we're seeing some really innovative narrative work being done in the space. And we haven't really seen that in any of the Lord of the Rings games previously. And it's a narrative heavy game. I mean, I really love, you know, the kind of Lord of the Rings games of yore. And I also really enjoyed what Monolith did with the uh, Shadow of Mordor series as well. But that being said, it's still not Lord of the Rings, right? We haven't really seen Gollum have his kind of time in the sun for good or for worse, but, or for better or for worse. But I'm interested. So I was going to actually look up. So I don't actually play a lot of um, Dedalic games. Yeah. And then, so I'm not like super familiar with their uh, gameplay style as a company. But I mean, clearly they've been around um, in the space for a very long time. And they have set themselves at, out quite a ways as far as like release date. So they said that this is anticipated to be coming 2021 around the time when the Amazon series for the Lord of the Rings is going to be dropping. So I think that that gives them plenty of time to polish and work on this and kind of shape what the game is going to be. But yeah, yeah. I think uh, I tried to look into it too, because I've, I'm not really familiar with them as well. So I was kind of going through their kind of backlog or their kind of their own heritage. And I was kind of trying to get a feel for what it possibly could be. I'm just still hoping that we have some sort of neck biting mechanic because I feel like if I'm playing as Gollum and I want to go full angry and evil, like he's got a, he's always, he's going, he's a very bitey and scrappy guy. So I don't know if like, what's going to be for him is his teeth. Right? Yeah, he's got the teeth and he's got those, those big kind of hands, you know, it's good for grabbing fish. Uh, yeah, I just saw this pop up and I was like, what an interesting choice. And the real question for me is how much or how little will Andy Circus be involved? I mean, that's not a bad question to ask. Andy Circus has his own game development studio. Um, I believe it's called um, Imperium Games. Let me look that up. Uh, no, Imaginarium. Um, Imagine. Mm, Google, help me out. Imaginarium is the name of the studio. So they put out that Planet of the Apes game last year, last mm -hmm. fall, for PlayLink on PlayStation. Um, so maybe question mark uh, i don't know it depends on how much motion capture they're going to do i mean he's not exactly the cheapest guy because he's very talented so yep, i'm exactly. not sure what budget they're working with but generally the um the tolkien estate that runs all of the ip stuff associated with tolkien's work has a very high bar to clear in order to be uh, accepted into kind of like the umbrella of what's um canonical tolkien work so i don't anticipate this being garbage because <laughs> that's there a good way to look at it. Really any garbage lord of the rings uh properties for that exact reason but it would be cool i would love to see andy circus involved and get his studio on board because the um, the narrative work that imaginarium is doing is actually really interesting because when i first met with them and the studio heads back at pax west two years ago i think it was uh, they discussed how they really want to make games more approachable for people who aren't necessarily identified as gamers. So that's why when they made um, the Planet of the Apes game, um, I should look up the exact name of that because it's called something different. Mm, I will look it up in a second. They're making something for Magic Leap right now, which I think is worth mentioning. But... They wanted to do something that was narrative based, but that you didn't need a controller to play. So you can just play it on your phone. And it's really just like you're touching on the narrative choices on the screen, very much like you would a telltale game on an iPad. Sure. Yeah. And those are obviously did find success for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. Rest in peace, telltale. Um, yeah. Rip. Uh, yeah, exactly. Were you big into those games at all? Uh, some of them. Um, I had to stop playing them because the games became just too clunky to play. And I got very frustrated as a player that the they didn't update their engine, that they didn't update their animation, that their art, art style. I think the straw that kind of broke the handles back for me was Game of Thrones, uh, which was disappointing because I love that franchise and that series. And I love that they got the voice talent from the series to do it. I was like, this is going to be so great. And then the Uncanny Valley and the art style just made me go, oh God, why? It's so bad. 
but the narrative work is still some of the best narrative work that we've seen in video games to date. And they absolutely deserve praise for that. It was just so sad the way it all shook out with management and how that team could have been saved. They could have gone on to keep doing really great stories, but I think that they were just overextending themselves and getting, you know, too deep into too many different projects without saying, you know what, instead of doing one project really well and crushing it, we're going to do like five projects at the same time and not fix our engine or our art style. And it's crazy because that art style works for certain properties. Like I loved The Wolf Among Us. I thought that was awesome. And I hope that season two comes back someday, sometime, because I was so glad that they announced it. And then I was like, no. And they canceled it. But I mean, when you have a comic book property, even like The Walking Dead, you're going to be able to take that cell shaded art style and translate it into what we saw a Telltale do. But you can't do that with everything. Like, I don't think it worked for um, Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't think it worked for Game of Thrones. And, you know, like Minecraft it worked for because that's a blocky art style to begin with. And it also worked for uh, Borderlands because that's a cell shaded art style too. So it's just like, I feel like they didn't pick and choose their properties or they didn't adjust their animation style enough to make it successful. That's probably a really long answer to that question, but that's okay. I really appreciate it. It just kind of reminds me of like, they tried to do what I feel like Lego it does, or I forget the group that's behind all the Lego games, but it's kind of like, we're going to do every franchise we possibly can. But the thing is with them, they had like an idea and a vision. And even though it is kind of sometimes monotonous uh, and very kind of simple, it just really works for them. And they were, you're right, they were overextending. And it was just like, oh man, they must be killing it because they're getting all these huge properties like over at Telltale, they must be doing well. And then like like hearing what actually happened, you're like, oh, what? Like, that, that's crazy to me that that actually happened. But yeah, uh, I am going to shame you a little bit for making the Lego comparison because I don't think that they are apples to apples at all. Bringing <laughs> franchises and licenses into the Lego universe universe is completely different than what Telltale was doing. And if you haven't played a TT game recently, you are missing out because some of the puzzle work that they do in the narrative work, the VO in that, in that franchise, whether it be a Marvel or a DC or Star Wars or Harry Potter or whatever, is some of the best VO work you're going to find in the industry bar none. So I can't give that team enough praise. So... Shame. I'm, not, I'm not giving them shame. I'm just saying another group that has been like tackling all the Marvel, all the DC stuff. It is not supposed to be like yeah, they've very... been talking it. It's it's different. Sure, they, it is different. And I wasn't gonna like obviously their VO has gotten better, but like they've changed some of the things that they used to do because it used to just be like not voice acted cutscenes or anything, and it was just kind of pantomime everything. So like they've changed and they've like they've added on to the package, whereas like I don't feel like Telltale did necessarily the same. So but yeah. again, I, the comparison is only like IP alone. It is not quality. I am not throwing shade at TT. Like that is not it at all. Even though some of your puzzles, guys, some of them get very frustrating. Like I'm like, what do I have to blow up to like make a thing? Like I'm like, come on, how many like little dancing blocks do I need? Uh, yeah, because I beat um was it uh, Marvel superheroes? That was like one that everybody really enjoyed. And it was like maybe one of the best Marvel superhero games we've had. Cause you could like fly around with Iron Man in like New York city, but then you could also be like Wolverine. I was like, Oh my gosh, when are we going to get this game? That isn't Lego. I don't know. I just want yeah. that Avengers game. Oh, by the way, I looked it up. Planet of the apes last frontier. That's what it Thank is. Thank you. Yeah. I, I wanted to double that. No problem. I got your back. It's all right. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, Gollum, we're excited. <laughs> it sounds like we're excited about it. I'm yeah, optimistic. Yeah. Is, I mean, to I'm going to be excited when I actually get to see it. Yeah. I've seen nothing. All I have is an announcement. Yep. But I mean, like I mentioned, I love that universe. I love pretty much anything around that universe. So, I mean, I spent hundreds of dollars and countless hours of my life in the Caban game, Middle Earth, um, back in the day, which just no longer exists, rip. But I love, I just like Tolkien properties, so... Yeah, are you excited, obviously, then, about Amazon's, like, TV series? Because, like, I mean, from the, oh, the hints yeah. and now the information we've gotten, it's like, okay, cool. Oh, yes. I'm incredibly excited because I love what Amazon is doing in the entertainment space, both on the movie and the TV front. And who has money to throw at a project? Amazon. You know what I mean? Like, they have tons of money. So I'm really pumped to see what they're going to do. Obviously, you know, the expectations are high. It's really hard to follow Peter Jackson's work because 
The work he did on that trilogy is some of the best filmmaking for an action franchise that we've literally ever seen. Uh, and I feel comfortable saying that. You know, you guys can fight me if you want to. Um, some of those, I mean, the battle at Helm's Deep is one of the best battle sequences in all of cinema. I mean, there's a lot of good ones out there, but it's certainly one of my favorites. Agreed. Um, so yeah. it's, it's the, like I said, the, the stakes are high. I'm really looking forward to getting a closer scope on what they're going to talk about, what that series is going to follow. Because I know they've said a little bit, but I want more details. You know, I want the nitty gritty. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. And it's obviously calculated because it's around the time that Game of Thrones is like wrapping up and getting into their spinoffs and stuff. So Amazon and everybody, I think Netflix sees this with The Witcher and they're like, there's a power vacuum for like this high fantasy, high budget. And they're mm -hmm. like, all right, let's just like do it really well and make sure everybody just kind of like focuses in on our thing as opposed to the others while Game of Thrones is kind of doing all these other little things and not doing the main story anymore. So yeah, uh, that makes sense to me. I'm all about that. Lord of the Rings is way better to be the Game of Thrones. That's just me though. So uh, I mean, I, you can say that definitively. Oh. And anybody that tries to say that Game of Thrones is better than Lord of the Rings, like just just get out. Just just leave. <laughs> all just right, out. perfect. Let's see. Don't, like let, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Goodbye. <laughs> I love it. That's that's a that's a bold stance, and I feel like that's that can make a friend for life right there, or an enemy for life. I don't know. Uh, but then again, I'm not again. If they're gonna be an enemy for life over that, then they've got they've got not enough problems in their life, and they should feel good about their life. That's true. Yeah, exactly. If you're feeling stressed out and you're like, "How dare!" Like, "Oh my gosh, this last season is gonna be the greatest thing ever." It's like, all right, just breathe, just breathe. Um, now, listen. When it comes to comparing the TV shows, time will have to tell. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think that's good though, because I'm glad that Game of Thrones exists uh, to kind of prop up or make Amazon have to say like, hey, we have to really nail this because people are going to be A, comparing us to an amazing legendary trilogy and B, to like one of the biggest TV shows of all time. Yeah. So. The series, Game of Thrones a television series is phenomenal. It's amazing television making. You know, certainly one of the best television series I've ever watched. I mean, the production values alone are insane and i love the cast and hbo just did such a wonderful job with it yeah not talking down at all this is coming from someone who loves game of thrones i'm just saying like game of thrones is here lord of the rings is up here you know what i mean <laughs> i love it that's good i completely i completely agree with you I'm not going to fight you on it. I'm not going to fight you You love them both, though, for the record. Yeah, that's okay. And that's okay. You can love both things. It's kind of like the stuff that happened with James Gunn recently. And they were talking, like, one of the uh, the people over at Warner Brothers said, like, hey, you could be both a Marvel fan and a DC fan. He can make a Marvel film and a DC film. It's okay. You can like both. You don't have to be like, I only watch one of these things. It's like, no, you can watch both of them. Like, you can, you can love it all, man. That's totally fine. And we yeah. win when they have to compete. We're the winners. Because it's like, oh, exactly. cool. It's like, yeah, cool. All right. Well, I think that's pretty much all the news for today. Now it's time to get into the segment of the show that we like to call Time Killers. Yes, it's the games we've been playing, the TV shows we've been viewing, movies we've been watching. Andrew, what have you been killing time with recently? Is that the creepiest you could make that? That was um, creepy. I could have done it worse, but I like to like <laughs> hold it back on the guests a little bit because I'm like, well, you know, if I ever want to have them back on, they're like, I don't know that one of the last things you did was kind of freaky. So... <laughs> Um, so time killers. So for me, there's two things. First thing is Queer Eye season three on Netflix. OMG. So good. If you've never watched Queer Eye, um, it's a show that is the spiritual successor to Queer Eye for the Straight Guy that used to be on cable television way back when. And they've rebooted it a little while back. And with five fabulous gay men who go around enriching people's lives. And what I love about what they're doing with the new season or the new reboot of Queer Eye now in season three is that each one of these gentlemen has a specialty that helps enrich people's lives. It isn't about telling them how they've been living their lives wrong or how they should live their lives. It's saying, let's take the life that you have and make it the best life it can be for you. Not form to some weird societal standard about what you're supposed to be wearing, what you're supposed to be cooking, you know, what kind of, you know, culture you're supposed to be enjoying. It's about saying like taking what you love and reminding you why you love it and kind of rediscovering you, who you are as a person. And it's just such a feel good show. And they, you know, approach people from all walks of life, you know, gay, straight, men, women, old, young. Um, and that's what I really love about what, you know, Netflix is doing with it. And so it's just 
such great feel good TV. If you just want to put on something that's going to leave you with some warm and fuzzies, Queer Eye is the show for you. So I've been really having a lot of fun watching that. Kind of sad that I'm binging it as quickly as I am because then I'm like, oh no, it's going to be over. And then I have to go back and rewatch it again uh, <laughs> until the next season comes out. But so that's a big um, time killer for me. And then, of course, for video games, I've been playing a ton of The Division 2. So really trying to maximize my time with that in between all the conferences and things that I've been doing. But I just hit World Tier 2 on my way to World Tier 3 in the end game. So my gear score is like around 330 or something like that. Okay. okay. So not bad. Doing good. Um, have you been playing The Division? I, I'll be honest with you. I, I want to. I just, I played the first one. And I've heard this one is leagues better. I've heard it's way, way better. It's and I, day. yeah. And the thing is, I, I kind of, I backed the Anthem horse and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that like, I, I will come back to division and these games as a service. It's kind of hard to like juggle multiple of them, even though I know yeah, everyone I know. would be like, yeah, you know, uh, but like there's like, happening in destiny to forsaken right now. Don't think I don't have my clan mates being like, who's got thorn. Let's go. Exactly. I was like, we got a question about Destiny for you that's coming up here. But uh, yeah, I, I do want to jump into it. But it's one of those things between, uh, you know, Anthem and Devil May Cry 5 that I've just been like, we got to pick and choose. Got to pick and choose True. sometimes. Well, how like, is Anthem going for you? I know obviously they had a very rocky start, but I'm looking forward to jumping back in once they push the next content update. Yeah. Uh, so I just put out a review on it, but uh, Anthem, you know, it's an interesting thing. And it's one of those games I wanted to like let breathe a little before I like made a real like kind of firm decision on. I think it's it's got some really fun things in it, but it is just it's still plagued by a lot of technical issues and mm -hmm. it can just feel kind of lifeless sometimes. And if you're playing with friends, it's totally fine. Like the loading screens aren't a big problem because you're just talking or whatever. But if you are playing alone, it is desperately apparent like some of that stuff you're just like oh my gosh like everything you want to do like if you want to take a step sometimes it feels like you need to have a loading screen because you're just like oh god yeah. i don't want to do anything anymore I um, but i i started to get like the good loot at the end of the game which it makes sense but like they're finally giving like i just got like a really cool like uh, ice storm for my storm uh, javelin and i was like oh cool this is like a legendary like spell ability i never had gotten one of those before like playing a ton of this end game stuff i finally got one and i'm like Dang, that took a while. Like, I'm like, oh, yeah. This yeah, I'm with you that there's so much potential in Anthem and the best locomotion and traversal in a game that feels so unique. The flying is so wonderfully done. And I love the design of the javelins and how unique they all feel. There's just so much missing uh, from the game. And it was such a disappointment for me having to be my, you know, most anticipated game of 2019. And all the work that I did with Bioware, you know, both at EA Play last year and all the preview events that I've gone to. And um, I was just bummed that they launched with kind of like super light on content. And I really hope that they kind of bring it back around because even just booting up the division and going into the store and looking what's available to buy. I was like, this is this is what Anthem needs. I want to buy stuff in the store. I want to earn stuff. And you can't gatekeep your coolest content 30 hours into a, a game. Like you're never going to get people to give you a chance. You know, it's, and it's tough because I know a lot of long RPGs do the same thing where they're like, well, it doesn't really get good until hour 20 of 100, right? But generally speaking, those are franchises that have predecessors that you can kind of look back on and go, well, this game was like that. If you think of like a Final Fantasy or even like a Dragon Quest, you know, or, you know, other big mainstay JRPGs that take a long time to like get good. It just like Anthem didn't have that working for it. They had it working against it, right? And there was a lot of anticipation for Bioware to deliver here after what happened with Andromeda. And it was just sad for me knowing how wonderful the people on that team are and how hard they worked that they kind of fell flat again. And I was like, oh, honey. It, it's, it's really, yeah, exactly. That's the problem too. And I think, out. yeah. And if it would have been any other studio, I think there wouldn't be this harshness to the same degree, just because so many people I think came in as Bioware fans. And they're like, oh, where's my story? Where's my story? Where's my story? And there is a story here and there's some interesting, fun stuff, some really great characters, some really excellent voiceover, but like, 
it just wasn't enough for those people. And then the other people who are coming in and trying this out, they're like, there's not enough content for me. Like one of the last major strongholds is just the final mission again, or I'm not getting different armor, like actual armor pieces and my guns, I can't change the look of those. And there's just like a few different versions of just like a light machine gun. It's like, there needs to be that variety to get people to just come back in. Cause with like division, there's so many different things you can do. And they've got like the gunsmith still. So like you get to like really kind of pick and choose all the little things you can get on your gun and how to upgrade that. And like, that is addicting. Whereas Anthem is like, they have all these weird components that are just hard to like literal components. You just have to like get rid of. Cause you're like, Oh, this ups some stats for something. I guess this is a better one. Like it's just, it doesn't feel meaningful. My javelin isn't changing or anything. I'm not, you know, I'm changing the colors, but besides that, it's like, yeah, it kind of looks, more or less the same as when I started. You want to have that progression, right? Like Monster Hunter World, like really showed that, like how yeah, addicting totally. that game was, like chasing a sword. And you're like, I got to kill this thing 20 times, but I'm going to have so much fun doing it. And that's the other problem too, is like every fight kind of plays out pretty much the same in Anthem. Whereas like in Monster Hunter, it's not fair to compare them directly, but in that one, They're I would play. Wildly different games, yeah. Yes, but they have a similar, like there's a similar loop you know, uh, and there's a similar want and a drive to go for these things. And I think going out with four people attacking an objective like this uh, and making it so randomized, because every time in Monster Hunter it was different, with Anthem it is always the same thing. And oftentimes we load longer than we actually play a mission. It's like, go to this spot, uh, like, kill these guys, go to this spot, kill these guys. Yeah, that's a little time. hyperbolic. but No, it's true. It is true. And I proved not, it. I have, it's not true yeah. anymore. It was before they pushed the patch that fixed a lot of the loading screens. But if you're playing shorter than a loading screen, then you're not really maximizing your time, I would say. But listen, I don't want to get too in the weeds of us having this discussion because I've talked ad nauseum about Anthem, uh, both on Kind of Funny Games Daily and on What's Good Games. So people know what I feel about it. I think like the final thought I'll say is there's a lot of room for growth and I'm looking forward to taking some time away and hoping that Bioware comes back. I really appreciated the statement that Casey made um, last week. And if you guys haven't read it, of course, please go check it out. And I look forward to seeing what they're going to do with the next big content launch. Sure. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Getting called hyperbolic on my own show. How dare you, Andrew? It was. Um, Just admit it. It, it wasn't. Was. And I've, I've got the footage to prove it. Um, okay, but anyway. I, well, okay, it's, I, I don't, I don't want that's I don't okay. Want. You don't want to see it. Don't worry about it. Anyway, let's move into my favorite segment of the show, community feedback and questions. This one comes in from Fragadin, and he, he's a big fan of yours. He says, hashtag critical podcast. That's how you reach us. He says, hey, Andrea, what's good? Being a big Destiny fan that you are, how are you feeling about the franchise's future? With the recent news that Josh Hamrick was leaving Bungie, granted he is only one of many at Bungie that keeps the wheels rolling, do you think this could be a bad sign? Also, have you been able to play any of the recent season of the Drifter content? I know you've been super busy, he says, but deep down, he just wants a good Andrea Renee rant on all of this. And he hopes <laughs> that everything go is going well with the What's Good gang and that you have fun at PAX this weekend. Oh, I thank you so much. Um, definitely been enjoying Season of the Drifter. I didn't get as much time to play in the um, Black Armory as I would have liked. I really haven't done the Forges at all, so I kind of missed that. So it was really helpful that the What's Good Guardians, our, our clan, helped kind of fast track me in those power surge bounties that got me up to the right light level to be able to compete with the, what's happening in Season of the Drifter has been fun. I think the changes they made to Gambit Prime are really interesting and exciting. Um, they're really difficult. Gambit Prime is really hard, but it's fun. I really like the Reckoning mode. I think it provides a, a, a top tier challenge for end game players. I still think they haven't quite found the balance between what to offer people who are playing quote for free and people who are buying the annual pass. And moreover, what to offer people who maybe are trying to get into Destiny now, because trying to fast track through it all is is really challenging and quite difficult, especially if you don't have somebody kind of sherpering you through it all. And they the, the RNG nature of Destiny still kind of grinds me a little bit. I love what they're doing cosmetically with emotes. I like that they are improving Eververse and allowing you to buy things directly. But I think that there's just too much that you still have to rely on random drops for. And that's really frustrating. As a player, I wish that I could go to one of the vendors in the tower and buy a piece of gear that I'm looking for. Sure, make it expensive. Make me have to grind for resources in order to be able to get it. But if, if all I need is a pair of high-level gauntlets and all I get are high-level helmets, you know, it can be really maddening to try to grind objects for engrams only to keep getting RNG drops. 
uh, you know, these randomly generated drops that aren't the thing that you need to help you get to the next level, or there isn't a quest that gives you a specific cloak or a specific pair of boots or whatever you're looking for. So I, I think that that's a long overdue addition because right now they're tailoring for end game, but none of the vendors have end game things you can buy. It's all early game stuff, which is kind of like a big, like, why have they not offered both? Like it should be not that difficult to do. So, I mean, that's like my little destiny rant for you. Um, when it comes to um, the other part of your question, which was. Do you want me to? Oh, I was okay. I was. Just... I'm like, I totally forgot what the other part of the question was. Season uh, of the uh, and... Yeah, Season of the Drifter, but also how do you feel about um, the franchise's future with uh, Josh oh, Hamrick yeah, leaving? I, I think it's fine. Um, at this point, Destiny is a behemoth of an IP. Um, they have hundreds of people at Bungie working on it. There's a lot of um, cooks in the kitchen, for lack of a better phrase, that are working on it. And a lot of these narrative beats are established so far in advance that even if one member of the team leaves, it's not going to really have a crazy ripple effect that you would think because they have to do so much work for so long. So I think if you're really concerned about the future of destiny you'll have to look at where we're at two years from now because i think a lot of the stuff we're going to see particularly over the next six to 12 months that ball was already in motion right like all that stuff was already happening i am interested to see now that they've partnered or separated their partnership from activision how they're going to change the release schedule for drops and if they're going to maintain the season that they've already laid out or if they maintain this current season how it's going to change for the next season and what ultimately we're going to be getting in the fall of this year i still hope they're going to push a big content update like they do have done every fall, but are they going to question mark? Don't know. Would you rebuy into that if it was coming out? It sounds like you're pretty hardcore into it. So you might, are your hands kind of tied? Like you just yeah. wouldn't want to I hop have in. given Activision and Bungie hundreds upon hundreds of my dollars for destiny. I will buy whatever they put out for destiny. Cause I'm an addict. Okay. That's okay. The first step's admitting <laughs> you have a problem. About it, but it means I'll definitely still give them the money. That's good. All right, that's good. That uh, it helps paint the picture. No, I'm just kidding. That's good. Well, it's nice that you're like you love this so much, and obviously this model is working for you, and it's something that you really enjoy. And you get to it sounds like you have like a clan that you work with and people that you're excited to do stuff with you. So it's never like you're hopping back in alone to grind stuff. You're like, oh, there's people True. who work with me, right? I mean, that makes all the difference. It really does. Like I love playing Destiny with my friends and with the clan and, you know, people who listen to what's good or kind of funny. And it's it's tough. I mean, I do enjoy solo queuing though too, because sometimes you just want to run strikes by yourself. You don't really want to get on comms and, and chat with people. Maybe you just want to do a couple of quick play rounds in the crucible and that's it. You're done for the day. Um, so you don't always need to have, you know, like squad up for a raid, for example, but that's fun too. You know, making an appointment to play a raid with friends is part of being in gaming culture. And one of the reasons a lot of us love playing video games. Yeah. All right, cool. I think you answered pretty much all the questions there. That was good. I hope Frag it in, you got enough of a, of a, uh, Andrea Renee, a destiny rant there. It's, that was good. <laughs> There's a lot of information thrown at me. I'm like, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> Uh, next question comes in. This is from Riley. He says, with the recent entry of Google into the gaming sphere with Stadia, do you share the same concerns as me and many others about game preservation with games like PT and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World not being available by legal means to buy anymore? Are you worried that games exclusive to streaming services will one day be unplayable? Yes, absolutely. This is one of the greatest concerns with a digital only and streaming only future is ownership over games for consumers and also preservation for games long term for the history books, right? There's so many games that even if they shut off their servers, you're still able to kind of boot them up and take a look at them. I think about a game that was really innovative for its time, like Disney Infinity. Oh. And the amount of work that went into something like that, and it's like gone now. But you can still put your Disney Infinity disc in and see parts of the game, even though the online connectivity is is gone and they're no, no longer updating, you know, the the infinity portal and the little figurines and things like that. But you know, it's tough when you get a game like one of my favorite games of the last five years, Paragon from Epic, the MOBA on PlayStation 4 and PC. I love that game. But I can't play that game. I can't even see. The only way I get to see that game is if I watch my old captures, you know? And, like, that's kind of heartbreaking. And when we talk about a digital streaming future that doesn't have a disk-based component at all or a download component, 
then we're really getting into some dangerous water when it comes to preservation. So I am with you that this is a concern. It's a valid concern. I'm also on the side, and call me negative Nancy if you want to, that I don't think that this is going to take off the way people think it's going to because there's still just too many hurdles. The When we got the stats from, I believe Windows Central was one of, it was either Windows Central or Kotaku, they got the stats about Stadia and its streaming tech. The idea that you have to have a, like a, a recommended 25 megabits per second internet connection to do 1080p is kind of wild. That's really fast for most people. And I know that there's a lot of people in positions um, that live in major cities like I do that are like, Psh, that's nothing. I got a thousand megabits up and down. I'll be the first to Stadia. And that's cool for you, bro. But there's hundreds of millions of people, if not billions of people around the world that barely have access to five megabits per second, let alone 25. So I think that when it comes to gaming for everyone, Stadia is going to be for the few for the time being. But I think what's exciting about Stadia and their tech really is cool is that they have the ability to bring gaming to people who can't afford to buy a box, right? Who can't afford to put $400 down on a PlayStation 4 um, and who want to be able to play from one of their other devices. Maybe their big tech spend for the year is their smartphone. And so they'll be able to buy a Stadia controller and connect it via Wi-Fi or what have you. But so I think that that is very exciting, but we're just not there. And one of the other bigger concerns that, you know, clearly Google isn't talking about is the way that global ISP infrastructure works from a government perspective and how the government, like we can just use the United States here as an example, has such a major hand and how that regulation happens, like what the speeds are, who owns the wires, who's going to have access to them the privacy concerns around what you're streaming and the data that they're going to be collecting. There's like a whole bunch of question marks around what Stadia is going to offer. But I agree, the idea of Stadia is super rad. But there's just like all of these concerns that are kind of lingering under the surface that are like, how is Google and all of the publishers going to address them? Yeah, yeah. Dang, uh, it's it's so hard to like, you know, have a conversation about this because you just do such a comprehensive job of like being like, here are both sides to it. I'm just like, yeah. Daddy Kathy, I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. It's excellent. I I prefer having that type of guest as opposed to just saying like, how do you feel about this? And be like, I don't like it. Uh, I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's true. like, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I think he brings up, and we all we all are kind of concerned about that sort of thing because we have seen examples of this, you know, previously, like the ones we, you know, aforementioned there. But to think that like a cool new exclusive game could come out and it could go wrong on Stadia or whatever else, and it could just be gone, and it's just like, I don't know, like yeah, you like you said, you just have your capture of it and just be like, well, I can watch it that way, but I can't interact with it in any yeah. other way ever because Google's just like, nope. And if it doesn't work, Google has walked away from things in the past. So if this doesn't work for them, there's a chance that that could happen. Like they'd just be like, eh, whatever, it didn't work. Well, like, mm. yes and no. With the amount of money that they've clearly invested in Stadia and the partnerships that they're developing, and I think having Jade Raymond as the head of the entertainment and gaming division is, says a lot, they can't just walk away from it as easily as they could like Google Plus, for example. Um, I think we're going to see Stadia as an experiment happen for at least five to 10 years. And then after that, you know, we'll see where their partnerships go. There's still a lot of unknowns about Stadia. And I think E3 is going to be a great time for us to maybe answer some more of these questions. Sure. Yeah. And it's obviously like any other console, even though this isn't one, I think it's really just the software. You know, there's the tech problems that we have to consider and see how it actually works. But if there's that true latency that we've been seeing and there's, you know, video game enthusiasts, we're great people, but we are quick to be judgmental. So if there's something even <laughs> minutely wrong with this, we'll we'll hop all over it. And if it's like, you're not like there's, I'm seeing some lag with some of the Assassin's Creed stuff. And I was like, that wouldn't fly in Fortnite or Call of Duty or anything like that. They'd be like, yeah, I'm not going to even mess with this. Like, I'm just not going to do it. I don't disagree with you, but right now every format has lag. They just do. I think what's different is that Google is trying to tout that there's no latency. There's no cheating. There's no hacking. There's no this. There's no that. I'm like, just stop it already. You're really shooting yourself in the foot by setting up the expectations to fail. Yep. Just acknowledge that there's going to be lag. People on PC who play with a hardwired internet connection and the fastest processor known to man still get lag because that's the way the internet works. It's just, that's just it. You know, it has hiccups. 
using technology has hiccups and that's okay. I think we as gamers understand that you're going to drop frames from time to time. You're going to get disconnected. You're going to get a blue screen if you're playing on PS4 like I am, you know, like that kind of stuff is just part of being a gamer and it's okay as long as you recognize that that's just part of being a gamer. Like I said, it's them mixing the messages and setting the expectations up for failure is where they're really getting into trouble. Sure. Yeah. I think it just the the problem is if there's a consistency in that leg and when you're trying to kind of, you know, decide as a person and we don't know the pricing for any of this either. That's the other thing is like they talk about all this, but we still don't know like how, you know, besides the controller, like what what do we really know besides that or beyond that? So th these are yeah. all factors that still play into it. And again, they need to show some killer stuff that people are like, I got to play that, you know, they got to have their like Microsoft with the scale bound type of thing or they have to show something like a a day's gone to go to Tsushima type thing. Like it's only, and you can play it on your browser. Like that's not going to happen for at least three to five years, like minimum. I'm, I'm not they, saying it's going to, I'm just saying that no, like, that's what that's they like need to do. That, like you have to think about it and go, what games are they going to launch with? Yeah. I mean, sure. They're probably going to launch with games that are already out now, but like, what's the benefit of playing them on stadia versus a system you already own? There's, I just have so many questions. Yeah, I know. And again, we're obviously horribly biased because we're lucky people who get to like have these consoles and be like, well, do we want this? And like for people who don't, like we said, that that's the idea and the hope that there are people out there who get to you know try these things they never ever would be able to. Is it going to be sensible for them? Is it going to be something that they can actually indulge in and enjoy as opposed to being like a headache? You know, so here's hoping. I hope it's great. You know, I hope it's <laughs> great. You. I want them to crush it. Yeah. I love people succeeding. I want them to succeed. I never root for people to fail. I just want them to succeed in the best way possible. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's, that's going against the negative Nancy that you've you've put up before. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Both sides. All right. Last question coming in here from Missile Mage says the Overwatch League team Philadelphia Fusion has just announced a 3,500 seater stadium built solely for esports. This coincides with Overwatch League being broadcast on mainstream television for the first time. Do you see a future where esports regularly sells out these stadiums and becomes as ingrained in people's lives as the more common sports do? I mean, they are already regularly selling out stadiums. So yes, easy answer. Um, Greg and I talked about this on Kind of Funny Games Daily um, and how it's, it's interesting because esports, despite its many attempts to break through to the mainstream, still is only catering to its very specific esports audience. Um, when I worked at Yahoo Esports, one of the goals of the team was to try to bridge the gap between the Yahoo Sports audience and the Yahoo Esports audience because the Yahoo Sports crew who ran all of the content and the coverage for Yahoo Sports was the one who was trying to run everything for esports. And it's just been um, really challenging to see so many people kind of try and fail to figure out like what esports is really all about. Sorry, there's a bug walking across my monitor and it's it's freaking me out. Okay. It's like it's just like I just got to get rid of it. Um it's distracting me going up and down the side of my monitor. Sorry about that. Um and I just think that Esports has a lot of potential, but I have maintained the opinion and still do that it's not going to break through to the mainstream culture the way that traditional sports has. And there's a variety of factors that play there. I think the first and foremost, um, esports is always going to be siloed into its individual categories. People that watch OWL probably don't watch the international and vice versa, right? People that are hardcore Counter-Strike fans probably don't really care about what's happening in the LCS. So and not to say that there's not some overlap, because of course there are. There are hardcore hockey fans that also love baseball and people that love basketball also watch football. But those sports are much easier to pick up the rules of than esports are. And that's really what esports challenge is, that in order to really fully enjoy what's happening on screen when you're watching, you know, the international you have to have a base understanding of what a MOBA is. And trying to get someone to explain the rules of a MOBA in like less than five minutes is impossible. I have friends of mine that have played Dota 2 for literally thousands of hours. Like that is not an exaggeration that still get lost when they're watching high level Dota 2 play. And that's what the trouble with esports right now is that they have a very enthusiastic audience of hundreds of millions of people around the world 
but I don't anticipate that growing exponentially over time because there's still the gatekeeping of you have to play the game to understand it. Whereas I never played hockey, but I can enjoy watching hockey because it's like super easy to get the rules. Just like with football, I don't need to know the intricacies of the rules of football or having to have played football in order to appreciate the athleticism that's on the, that's on the, on the field. Now there's, I'm sure people out there that are, would be happy to argue that point with me, but let me tell you, when you watch a game of league and you don't know who the heroes are, the champions are, or who, what the items are, or what's happening, or even like what the terms are, like what's jungling, what's mid lane, you know, what's all of this stuff happening? Like how, what does kiting mean? Right? Like it, it makes it not as fun to watch. And I think that's esports greatest problem right now. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, the one that kind of gets away with it and that I've heard other people getting into, like parents of people just checking out, it's like the Street Fighter tournaments, like the fighting tournaments, because it's so simple to understand it. Yeah, because yeah, you're like, there's one guy here and one guy here, and they're trying to punch each other until one of them goes away. You know, like that's yeah. kind of like the base level of, but you're right, because like with MOBAs, I can, I can try to give you that five minute spiel, but at the same time, I can't tell you all the items and all the characters and like all their abilities. Cause like all of that is just pure crazy calculus where it's just like, all right, unless you have that fact sheet sitting with you, you're like, Oh, he can do this. That's why he shot that laser beam. Like, cause you don't know if who can shoot laser beams and who cannot shoot laser beams. Yeah. Like that's, that's so hard to get into. So I completely agree with you on that. And I think Maybe that's why, like I said, the street fighting stuff or street fighter that works a little bit better, the fighting games. And then maybe kind of the first person shooters are a little more accessible. They're still insane. Like Overwatch is kind of like a MOBA on the yeah, ground I mean, sometimes. Counter Strike is probably the most accessible of the shooters that are out there. Um, even something like Rainbow Six is a little bit more accessible if you're into that. But when you watch high level play, it's not like watching your friends play. Like they have very specific strats. And like they play in a very specific way. And I feel like it's not really representative of what the game is like overall when you're playing, you know, watching professional play. But I, I, I want people to be clear. This doesn't mean that I don't think it's going to be successful. Clearly, the amount of money that's floating around in esports means that somebody's collecting somewhere. I just don't think it's ever going to eclipse uh, traditional sports or be stand alongside traditional sports. I, I just think that, you know, we grow up playing playing sports. I mean, you play basketball and flag football or baseball from a time you're like little kids, you know, like thinking about like little league and things like that. So you have an inherent um, affinity for them from a very young age. And until we can get video games that, at that competitive level into younger kids' hands, it's just never going to, it's never going to penetrate. And even if we do, I think that the skill involved with playing high level video games is such a smaller fraction of the populace of the, of the world than playing sports um, that it's just never going to, they're just never going to stand toe to toe. Yeah. yeah. So basically what we're both saying here is put more MOBAs in those elementary school classrooms. We want all the kids to, like, you know, ki <laughs> in kindergarten. They need to be clicking away. They just need Listen, to get that. Everybody can play rocket league. Let's go. Oh my gosh. That would be, <laughs> that would be see rocket league. And you just be like, oh, it's just soccer with cars. Don't worry about it. Like, I want to see more of that high level play because some of that stuff those people could do. I'm like, I don't even what what is that? What did you just do there? That was a incredible. lot of it's luck. Let's just be honest. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Uh, to the Rocket League players out there, we don't all believe it's just luck. I'm sure <laughs> there's some skill to it. Uh, it was just luck. I said um, a lot of it was luck. A lot of it was luck. That's great. Um, anyway, I think uh that's it for questions. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about the esports stuff before we move on? Because that's a it's a pretty big stadium and it sounds like they're popping up everywhere around here, especially in the United States. Like I wonder if they'll yeah, keep going up the world. Several of them throughout the United States. Um I had a good chuckle when we were on KFGD because um one of the guys in the press release said this is the first esports stadium. And I was just like, no, it's not. It's it's very obviously not the first one. Didn't you have a PR person that fact checked this for you? Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting. A lot of money is floating around in overwatch league and, you know, Blizzard had mentioned that they were going to start doing hometown teams instead of just centralizing all of the competition, uh, where Blizzard's located in Southern California. And I think that's good. I think that's the way you get your local communities involved and to try to grow fandom for esports is to make, put it in people's backyards, you know, like not silo it off in some studio in SoCal that's already right next door to Hollywood. So they're like, oh, it's just another thing that's happening, you know? I think a place like Philadelphia is cool because like what else is happening there with video games on a regular basis? And I know they have, you know, a PAX tabletop there, but 
I mean, that's pretty much it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You make a really good point. And it, you were totally right by putting it kind of and making it seem much more approachable by making it seem like it's less just like, oh, it's West Coast kind of elite or like only special people get to do. It's like, no, anybody can play. You can come watch anytime. It's like something that you can get into and it doesn't have to be something that's so scary to attempt or go see and enjoy. So I think it's, I think it's smart and uh, we'll see how they do. It just seems like they're popping up a bunch and I just hope that it can sustain. Cause like the saddest thing would be like, Oh, we made these stadiums and we just have to like repurpose them to whatever else. I mean, they're going to anyway. Let's, yeah. let's be clear based yeah. off what I've heard about how the esports arena in Las Vegas is going. I mean, but listen, any sports team has to do double duty with their venue because they don't have games all the time and rent's expensive. Uh, so I will be interested to see what else they do in that stadium besides overwatch league and what other competitions that they can bring. And um, obviously Fortnite just announced their world cup. So that's exciting. Yep, that <laughs> game, the game that keeps on going, uh, and we'll see. I'm I'm always interested to hear, like, where that game is, like, at a spot now, like, with League of Legends in my mind, where I don't really hear as much as I used to about it. It's just, like, in this echelon way up here. Like, there's always, like, these little updates and things, but it's just, I'm like, oh, there's just, like, a billion people playing it, or, like, yeah. millions of people and playing for, it. And for some reason, despite, the, despite how huge Fortnite is around the world, I still just don't put it in the same echelon as all of the other esports. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, Maybe that's me being dismissive to Fortnite pro players, but I'm kind of like, listen, like I I just could never put a Fortnite pro player next to a Counter-Strike pro. pro I know player. those Counter-Strike like, people I, are insane. It's I like they know. come around a corner <laughs> and they shoot and it's just like, I don't even, you got them. I'm like, how did you, how did you do that? Like, that's, that's incredible. You know, I hear you. I hear you. I'm right there with you. Well, perfect. Thanks. Well, uh, yes, we, we agree. That's a good way a good way to close out the show. But if you ever, anyone listening to this, ever have a question or a topic you want to hear here on the show, you can just tweet the hashtag Critical Podcast. You can tweet at our official account, which is at Go Critical. It's capital G or capital C. Or you can tweet at me personally. I'm at Jimmy Good 13 But if you just want to tweet at Andrea, tweet her a nice thing, a gif of something. Uh, Andrea, yeah. where, where will they find you? Um, at Andrea Renee on Twitter is the best place. It's the platform I'm the most active on. Um, please download our podcast, What's Good Games. You can find it. Um, I just kicked my camera. Uh, you can <laughs> find it on any of your favorite podcast services um, on Apple and iOS, or excuse me, Apple and uh, Android. Um, you can also find us at youtube.com slash what's good games. And of course, you know, as Jimmy mentioned, I host with Kind of Funny. I host there a couple times a week for Kind of Funny Games Daily, which is at youtube.com slash kind of funny games or twitch.tv slash kind of funny games. She just did that right off the dome. She didn't even, she hasn't had it practiced. So what is What's Good Games for people who might not know what it is? Because I know you talked about it in the beginning a I'm gonna little bit. To, I'm going to try to kick my camera back into position. Oh, no, I'm messing it up more. Oh, no. Hold it was on. first the bug, and now it's this. <laughs> uh, almost. Uh, uh, good enough. Yes, there we go. Yeah, we first did it. Um. So what's good games? Um, the short tagline is it's an upbeat show for the nerd inclined. Your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. So it's a once a week show that I do with Brittany Brombacher and Christine Steimer. And we have a combined 30 years of experience in the professional video games business um, that comes from all different facets from media to community development and management to, to game development, um, to marketing and PR. So we really bring a really diverse uh, cross section of experience to the table. And that's what, you know, we really use as our pitch and our hook for our video game show versus the thousands of other shows that are out there. So we ha like to have a good time. You know, we kind of bring a little bit of a different vibe from each of our perspectives, uh, from Steimer's favorite games to Brits to mine. But it's a really fun show. And um, we have a great community. If you're looking for a fun place where you can have a positive experience online, uh, we really kind of rule the What's Good Games community with an iron fist. So no trolls, uh, no jerks, no people coming in, just us pick fights. We're just all about great community discussion about games that we love. And so we have a really active fan page, uh, What's Good Games fan page. We also have a Discord, discord.gg slash What's Good Games. If you're looking to have some friendly conversations with other gamers who like to love stuff. Excellent. Perfect. That's a really good pitch. That sounds good to me. Uh, yeah. And if you want to support What's Good Games, where can they do that? 
Oh, yeah. So we just revamped our Patreon tiers. So patreon.com slash what's good games. If you want to get involved with our membership, we have four basic levels of membership um, that give you a wide variety of, of benefits from shout, shout outs on the podcast to an ad free podcast, uh, a bunch of really cool stuff. We do like handwritten postcards every month for the higher tiers. So you can check out all of those details at patreon.com slash what's good games. And that'll all be linked down below. And if you're interested in supporting anybody this week, please go check out What's Good Games. Um, tell them that Jimmy from Critical Review sent you. Go support yeah. them. Go you know, share their stuff around and go look into it because they do a lot of good stuff and they have access to a lot of really interesting people. I know we talked a little bit about Days Gone in the past, but also like Corey Barlog, a ton of like really cool people it, like actually making games like that you can actually go and you know listen to them, talk to them. So please do that. Andrea, once again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come hang oh, out with me. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. You're welcome anytime. Thank you. Thank you. And to everybody who's listening, we appreciate it. We'll see you next week. And just remember to adapt and overcome. Bye.